Welcome back to Gina's Book Nook. I'm glad to have you here. I hope that you'll take a second to subscribe. Just click that subscribe button so that each time I post something, you will be informed. I don't want you to miss any part of this wonderful book, um, The Story of Edgar Sawtell by David Wodolowski. We are on part eight. Uh, this chapter is called Courtship. If you remember from the last reading, um, Edgar's mother is very, very sick. His father has passed away and there was uh, quite an event in the kennels and some dogs got injured. In the house, Claude walked across the kitchen and knocked at the closed bedroom door, coat bunched in his hand. Edgar knelt and stroked Almondine's muzzle. What happened tonight, he signed. Why couldn't you stand? She dug her nose along his arm and leg, sending him to divine what had happened after he left the house. Her eyes were bright. She searched his face. When he was satisfied she was okay, he stood and walked to the bedroom door where Claude was still waiting. Trudy? Claude said, knocking a second time. The door swung back. Edgar's mother stood there holding the jam for balance. Her hair was matted with sweat, her eyes set in hollowed circles above chalk-white cheekbones. Claude drew a quick breath at the sight of her. Christ, Trudy, you need a doctor. She turned and sat on the bed, and she looked past Claude as if his presence hadn't registered. Edgar, she said, is Epi okay? What time is it? Before Edgar could sign an answer, Claude said, she had a cut, she has a cut near her eye, but it wasn't deep. Finch is going to be limping for a few days, that's all. They looked worse than they actually were. Edgar's mother nodded. Thanks, Gar, you're right. I don't think these antibiotics are working. Could you drive me to see Dr. Frost? They stood in silence for a moment. At first, Trudy didn't recognize her mistake, but Claude's posture straightened as if he had laid a hand on some low voltage wire. Something like embarrassment and fear and another feeling he couldn't name made Edgar's face flush. Uh, yeah, Claude said, I can do that. Trudy passed her hand in front of her face as if clearing cobwebs. Claude, I mean, Claude. Oh, I'm going to lie back down. Wake me at eight, would you? And then I'll call and make an appointment. Not a chance, Claude said. We're going now. But he won't even be in his office for another hour and a half. Oh, he will He will be after I call him, Claude said. She insisted Edgar stay behind, that he not get near her, and reluctantly he agreed to stay and watch Epi and Finch and Almondine. Claude backed up his car up the driveway and headed toward town with Edgar's mother huddled against the passenger side door. Edgar dragged himself through morning chores, lining the pens with the straw bells he'd slept on the night before the fight. He checked on the pups in the whelping room and weighed them for the log sheets and sat in the straw in the corner of the pens and dozed. The pups mustered the courage to mount an attack. He brushed them aside, but they charged again, biting his fingers and shoes and the belt loops on his jeans, and then he pushed himself up and went to Eppie's pen. Later, he would blame himself for not seeing what would happen, as if he could have prevented it. But during the weeks that followed, his preoccupation was above all with his mother's health and the mending of the injured dogs. He cleansed and salved Epi's sutures every morning and held warm compresses in place until they had cooled in his hands, leaving for school with his fingers stained brown from antiseptic. Her fur began to grow in, but she was distrustful and skittish. Finch's leg healed quickly. Most important of all, Almondine's spell in the kennel was not repeated. But lying in bed, Edgar would reenact the events of that night, changing the smallest action to stop everything from unraveling. If I'd let fewer dogs out, if I hadn't fallen asleep, if I had fed them the right way. Sometimes he worked himself all the way back to, if she hadn't gotten sick, if I could have made a sound, if he didn't die. The future, when he thought about it all, held little threat and little promise. When the Apollo returned that afternoon and his mother emerged on steadier feet, new prescription in hand, he thought all their mistakes had finally been made. She needed to recover. 
His father had died in January. It was the, only the end of May. They needed to stick to the routine they'd established during the intervening months. In that way, their life would return to its original shape, like a spring stretched in bad times, but contracting eventually into happiness. That the world could come permanently unsprung never occurred to him. And so for the longest time, he was oblivious to what was happening. For where his mother was concerned, something seemed no more possible than if she might suddenly fly through the air. The pace of work hadn't slackened. The pups came first, then the food, the water, the cleaning, the meds. The rest of their time was devoted to training. While his mother was still recovering, Claude arrived in the morning, unloaded supplies, and helped with chores. Edgar walked Finch up and down the aisles so he could judge the dog's recovery. Afterward, Claude stayed only long enough for a cup of coffee, drinking, standing up with his jacket on. Ed Edgar's mother talked to Claude about what needed to be done in the kennel as though they had come to some agreement about his helping out. Then he set his coffee down and walked to his car. After she was back on her feet, Claude stopped appearing in the morning. Since he wasn't there when Edgar boarded the school bus, there was no reason to believe he'd been there at all. Until one afternoon, when he came across a pile of white soap shavings on the porch steps. Claude came for dinner the next evening. The moment he entered, Edgar's mother's movements grew slower, more languid. And when the conversation turned to Eppie and Finch, Edgar understood that Claude had been out to the kennel many times since Edgar had last seen him, including that day. By then, nearly a month had passed. After dinner, Edgar went upstairs and he listened to their footsteps, their murmured talk, not quite covered by the noise of the television. Her wor words filtered up to him lying in his bed. Oh, Claude, what are we going to do? Her question ended with a sigh. Edgar rolled over and waited for sleep, listening and not listening. If she hadn't been gone that day, if I hadn't been in the mow, if I'd been able to speak. Sometime in the night that Paula started with a throaty rumble, in the morning when Edgar stood beside his bed, fiery spikes radiated from the center of his chest. It was warm now, at least on some nights. One evening, he walked out onto the porch and straddled an old kitchen chair to watch the sun set. Days of sunshine had melted the snow in the field and a brief rain had rinsed everything clean. Almondine found a spot on, an old, on the old rug and began chewing a bone, her mouth propped open against the hollow end. Shortly, the kitchen door opened and his mother's hand came to rest on his shoulders. They listened to the water drip from the roof. I like that sound, she said. I used to sit here and listen to water run off the roof like that before you were born. I know, he signed. You're very old. He felt rather than heard her laugh. She dug her fingers lightly into his shoulders. This is the time of year your father found that wolf pup. Do you remember us telling you about that? Parts of it. See those aspens down there? She reached over his shoulder and he closed an eye and sighted along her arm at a stand of trees occupying the lower corner of the field. When he came up from the woods that day, those were only saplings. You could wrap your fingers around the trunks of most of them. They'd just begun to leaf out. I happened to be looking there when your father came through. It was the most amazing thing. He just shimmered into place, walking so slow and cautious. At first I thought I'd hit hurt himself. It made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up to see it. Because you thought he was hurt? Or because of how it looked? Both, I suppose. I should have known he was carrying a pup right away. He was walking the same way he carried a newborn in the kennel. With his shoulders hunched? Yeah, but from a distance. I didn't recognize it. The sound of her voice was pleasant, and Edgar felt like listening, and he supposed she felt like talking. He'd heard bits and pieces of the story as far back as he could remember, but now she told him about the miscarriages that preceded it, the final trip to the hospital, the figures in the rain. By the time she finished, the aspens at the back of the field had dissolved into the gloaming. Did you ever name the baby? No, she said at length. Suppose it had lived. His mother took a deep breath. I think I know what you're getting at, Edgar. Please don't ask me to compare different kinds of grief. 
what I'm trying to tell you is that after the miscarriage, I lost myself for a while. Time passed that I don't, I don't even remember much. I can't explain what it was like exactly, but I remember feeling angry that I'd never had a chance to know that baby before he died, not even for one minute. And I remember thinking I'd found a place where none of it had happened, where I could just rest and sleep. He nodded. He recalled how, waiting in the barn beside his father that day, something had blossomed before his eyes when he closed them, something dark and forever inward turning. He recalled how, after a time, he had found himself walking along a road, how the one Edgar had stayed with his father and the other had kept walking, how all around the road was pitch dark and how rain was falling on him and gently drenching him. And he remembered thinking that as long as he stayed on the road, he was safe. Do you want to know why that hasn't happened to me now? She said. Why? Because I did have a chance to know your father. It's so unfair he died that I could scream. But I was lucky enough to have him for almost 20 years. That's not enough. I could never have known him enough. Not if we both lived to be a hundred. But it is something. And that makes a difference to me. She paused again. What happened to your father that night, Edgar, is not your fault. I know. No, Edgar, you don't know. Do you think I can't read you? Do you think I can't see? You think just because you don't make a sign for something, it isn't written all over your body and how you stand and walk? Do you know you're hitting yourself in your sleep? Why are you doing that? It took a moment to sink in. When he stood, the chair clattered to the floor behind him. What do you mean? Unbutton your shirt. He tried to walk away, but she laid a hand on, her, on his shoulder. Do it, Edgar, please. He unfastened the line of buttons and let his shirt fall open. A bruise mottled with sickly blue and green covered the center of his chest. Somewhere, an icy tuning fork struck a bar of silver and rang and rang. He walked to the bathroom and stood before the mirror and pressed a fingertip to the bruise. An ache pulsed outward from his ribs. How long had he been waking with that feeling of an anvil hanging, having been dropped on his chest? A week? A month? What is that? Trudy said when he walked into the kitchen. Damn it, Edgar. What's going on with you? You're so closed up around your sadness. You've left me here alone. You can't do that. You can't shut me out. As if you're the only one who's lost someone. She put her hands on his shoulders. In the mornings, when you walk into the kitchen, I'll see you out of the corner of my eye and I'll think you're him. That's crazy. I don't look anything like him. Yes, you do, Edgar. You move like him. You walk like him. I've watched you in the whelping room and you even carry the pups like him just the way you described with your shoulders hunched up. Taking those careful steps, do you realize... There are times when I need to leave the house, but it's just you and me because I look at you and I feel like he isn't gone. I come back from the barn some nights and I can't help myself. I go up to your room to watch you and it's the only time you let me near you. It's the only way I can get close to you or him. I'm not him, I'm not half who he was. Then a rack of shivers ran through him and he pushed past Trudy onto the porch buttoning his shirt. There was something else he'd wanted to say, but discovering the bruise on his chest had swept everything else from his mind. Edgar, I know what it's like to disappear into bad feelings. I know how tempting it is. You think by going further into it, you'll finally come out the other side and everything will be okay, but it doesn't work that way. You need to talk to me. I can't shake the feeling you haven't told me everything that happened. I did. I told you, I came down from the mow and there he was. I had to wait for someone to show up. The handset on the phone was shattered. I got mad and hit it on the countertop. I told you that. What else, Edgar? What else happened? Nothing. Then what is that? She said, pointing at his chest. I don't know. I must have fallen against something. I just don't remember. Pages, pages. 
Edgar, I've watched you do it in your sleep. You're hitting your chest. You're trying to sign something. What is it? He couldn't reply. Paralyzed by the memory of throwing his fists against his body, every time he thought of it, it almost shook with the blow. He stood on the porch, he, his ragged exhalation matching hers, until at last he remembered what he wanted to say. Claude isn't like him either. Now it was his mother's turn to be silent. She looked past him into the field and sighed. After that last miscarriage, I wanted to have an operation to make it impossible for me to get pregnant. I liked that idea. That way I could be sure I'd never feel that bad ever again. But your father said I was only imagining the worst case. One more time, he said. Not because it won't be terrible if it happens again, but because it will be wonderful if it doesn't. And he was right, Edgar. The next time, we had you. I can't imagine what our lives would have been like if your father hadn't believed so strongly in fresh starts. He turned and stared out into the night. Edgar, there's a difference between missing him and wanting nothing to change. They aren't the same things at all and we can't do anything about either one. Things always change. Things would be changing right now if your father were alive, Edgar. That's just life. You can fight it or you can accept it. The only difference is if you accept it, you get to do other things. If you fight it, you're stuck in the same spot forever. Does that make sense? But aren't some thing changes worth fighting? You know that's true. So how do you know which is which? I don't know a way to tell for sure, she said. You ask, why am I really fighting this? If the answer is because I'm scared of what things will be like, then most times you're fighting for the wrong reason. And if that's not the answer, then you dig in your heels and you fight and fight and fight. But you have to be absolutely sure you can handle a different kind of change because in the end, things will change anyway, just not that way. In fact, if you get into a fight like that, it's pretty mu it pretty much guarantees things are going to change. He nodded. He knew she was right, but he hated what she said. A person could stop a specific thing, but they couldn't stop change in general. Rivers can't run backward, yet he felt there must be an alternative, neither willfulness nor resignation. He couldn't put words to it. All he knew was neither of them had changed their minds and neither of them could find anything more to say. He stood there until his mother turned and went into the kitchen, and then he pushed open the porch door and walked to the barn. There was plenty of binder twine lying around now at the mow. With a little trial and error, he fashioned a double loop and a tail he could knot around the bed frame. The thing was easily hidden beneath the planks, and if she walked in at night, he wouldn't see it. He passed his wrist through the rabbit ears. All it took was a twist to keep them from slipping free while he slept. Late at night, the rotary dial on the telephone resonated through the walls. The rip of a digit rolled, rolled clockwise, the grind of the dial working backward, loud enough to wake him. Whatever part of our conversation wasn't captured by the handset rode on air currents through the old house. A gray smoke so fine it drifted up the stairs and through the furnace registers. <coughs> Sorry. And wherever it brushed a wall or a curtain or a light bulb, it crumbled into a dust that settled over everything. In the mornings, he tucked the twine into the toe of an old tennis shoe and looked at the chest in the mirror. It worked surprisingly well. The first thunderstorm of spring came through in the middle of a night. Lightning flashing through the sky and thunder rattling the glass in the windows. And in the morning, the storm had lapsed into a ceaseless, undramatic rain. Slow, even sheets of water that paused for a minute or an hour, but soon enough returned along with a splash of water, running off the eaves. After two days, the basement began flooding. It was no surprise, and no emergency either. The legs of the tables had long been set in coffee cans. Edgar watched the water seep through the rocks. Schultz had set in his basement walls. The float rose in the sump pit twice an hour, and the lights flickered as the motor engaged. Then a thump of the column of water hit the elbow in the vent pipe. 
Outside, the world became a riot of vegetable odors, boggy and florid, the waft of old hay, tamarack, algae, moss, sweet sap and rotted leaves, iron and copper and worms, a musky yawn that hung in the yard. For two nights in a row, the dogs woke him. They'd begun leaving the run doors op up at night, and the dogs slept with their muzzles propped against the wooden thresholds. From his bedroom window, he could make out their black noses and shining eyes. The first night, he ignored their barks and rolled over and covered his head with his pillows. But the second night, he detected a kind of fervor in their tone that drew him fully awake. He picked out the voices of Essay and Opal over the drumming of falling rain. He and Almondine knelt at the window. The dogs were standing wet in their runs, tails slashing happily behind them. Deer in the orchard, he thought, or a raccoon. He went to the spare bedroom where the window faced the orchard and the road. There was nothing to see. By the time he had walked back to his room, the dogs were silent again. It occurred to him that the dogs might have seen Forte, and that idea cheered him. The stray seemed just contrary enough to come back after wintering with some adopted family. Edgar lay awake in his bed, hoping now the dogs would start up again, or that he would hear Forte's howl. With his attention so pitched, he began half hearing a voice. The voice he'd heard in the barn when he'd slept there. The voice he'd heard, now he remembered, the night before. Always intertwined with some other sounds, he heard his name cried as the bed springs creaked. A wordless call in a gust of wind against the window pane. He sat up and pulled books off the shelves, running his eyes over the letters like so many scribbles until the sky lightened outside his window. At breakfast, he waited for his mother to mention the barking. Did the dogs wake you last night, he asked finally. No, were they barking? A lot. That's okay, she said. They get restless with the thaw. But the, by the time he finished evening chores the next day, he was so tired he staggered up the stairs and fell into bed. It was pitch dark when the sound of his name woke him. This time it had come through the splash of rain in the gutters. He sat up in bed, arms folded, listening. In a minute, the dogs began again. He slipped out of bed without turning on the light, raised the sash, and craned his head out. Everywhere, rain was falling. Directly below his window, Claude's and Paula sat parked in the driveway. In each pen, a dog stood, baying. He slipped on his jeans and shirt and haphazardly tied his shoes. He crept down the stairs, hand on Almondine's back to slow her. His mother's bedroom was dark. The clock in the kitchen read 1.30. He knelt before Almondine. You have to stay. I don't want you to get wet. He opened the porch door and leaned out. A breeze tousled his hair. There was no lightning, no thunder, just the steady whisper of warm rain, like the murmur of the creek. The sound that had once made Almondine pounce on the snow-covered creek as if something hid there. Silvery sheets of water poured into the gutters around their roof. Near the door was a light switch. When he flipped it, the goosenecked flood lamps over the barn doors came on, casting a cone of light across the rough planks of the double doors. He half expected to see a woodchuck or a fox scurrying off, but there was only the glint of rain dropping into the light. And yet the dogs kept barking with such a strange mixture of alarm and recognition, wet and shining as they looked into the yard. A flicker danced in the rain before them and was gone. Edgar was about to turn back inside when something caught his attention near the barn door. When he looked closer, there was just rain. Then abruptly, the dogs fell silent. They braced themselves four-footed and shook off and one by one trotted to the portals of the back of their runs where they pushed through the canvas flaps and disappeared. Whatever was making them bark, Edgar thought, had to be inside the kennel. He was never going to find out what it was standing on the porch. He turned to Almondine one last time and knelt to quiet her. Then he stepped into the rain and began to cross the yard. He was drenched before he reached the corner of the house. The same rain, warm on his hand, now soaked through his shirt and jeans, chilling him, but it was pointless to go back for a coat. 
He walked to the impala and pressed his hand against the hood. The engine was cold as stone. He stepped onto the weed-covered hump in the center of the driveway, muddy streams on either side of him. In the pale glow of the yard light, the freshly greened grass looked greasy black. The two tall pines stood shivering like sentries, water cascading down branch by branch, but there were no deer, no streaks of red that would be a fox, no shining eyes of a, of a raccoon. He turned and walked to the deserted runs, wiping a streaming hand over his face. From one of the small doorways, the dog's head and shoulders emerged, essay, watching his approach. Half in and half out. When he squatted down and pushed his fingers through the wire mesh, he buckled along down the run, stepped into his shadow and licked his fingers, blinking at the rain. Her posture conveyed curiosity without anxiety, anticipation, but not fear. What's going on out here, he signed. Where would you go if I opened this door? What would you chase? Essay waved her tail and met his gaze as though turning the question back on him. He pulled himself upright along the timber of the door. The waterlogged wood of the frame creaked. He turned to look behind him to see what the dogs might have seen. The yard light high atop the pole in the orchard cast its globe of yellow. The earth mounded away from him, passing beneath the trees of the orchard and leveling near the road. The house sat at the edge of the light bright along the driveway side, dim where it faced the garden. The shadows of the apple tree lay stretched across the grass, the forest across the road, an undulating scrim of gray. High in the air, raindrops descended into the light, curtained by the breeze, into willow shapes that swayed across the yard and back into the night. When Edgar glanced back, Essay had retreated into the barn and a line of glittering eyes watched him from the canvas flaps. He rounded the milk house and walked through the cone of light beneath the floodlight over the barn doors. When he reached the silo, he tried to look out over the field to the west, but his eyes were daz dazzled and the dart began just a few yards beyond. He stared into the blackness toward the, black, the back runs and saw nothing. Just the sight of the silo sliding off into the dark in the silhouette of the broad roof. After a moment, he turned back to the barn. And for the second time that night, something moved in front of the double doors. It took a moment to make sense of it, a change in the falling of the rain, something about the way it fell. He stepped forward to look more closely, traced a single drop of water as it passed into the light. Just above his head, the raindrop passed, wobbling in midair like a transparent pearl, and began to fall again. It splashed into the puddle at his feet. He wiped his face and looked up. Another raindrop had taken its place, and then that one fell to be replaced by another and another. Nothing he could see and held them in the air, yet each one hovered for a tick of time, then continued to the ground. He watched it happen a dozen times or more. Despite himself, he reached out to touch the spot, then hesitated at the last moment. He stepped back and saw the same thing was happening up. Uh, um, all up and down the space in front of him. Hundreds of raindrops, thousands, sus suspended for a heartbeat in the lamplight. He caught a glimpse of something, then lost it. He squeezed his eyes shut. It was like watching the orchard, trying to catch everything motionless for one instant. When he opened his eyes again, the way to see them all together, he clicked in, and they had clicked into place. Instead of raindrops, he saw a man. His head, his torso, arms held away from his body, all formed by raindrops suspended and instantly replaced near the ground. The figure's legs frayed into tattered blue-gray sprays of water. When a gust of wind passed through the yard, the shape flickered and the branches of the apple trees twisted behind it, refracted as through melted glass. Edgar shook his head and turned away. An endless cascade of raindrops struck his arms and neck and face. The same breeze that shimmered the figure, the figure caressed his skin, carrying a swampy, marshy smell. There was the scent of the kennel and of the water itself. Suddenly he needed to touch something, something too solid to exist in a dream. He stumbled to the barn, he ran his palm against the planks of siding. A wood sliver snagged his skin and slid into the flesh at the base of his thumb. The pain was brief and hot and unquestionably real. He glanced around. The figure in the rain had turned to watch. He attended once more to the barn, his examination now minute and frantic. 
He traced and rested the rusted iron door hinge with his fingertips and the jagged crevices between the boards where the shadows were as sharp as the line dividing the moon. He knew if he had waited long enough, he would see crazy things, fantastic, inex inexplicable, dreamlike things. But everywhere he looked, he found the ordinary stuff of the world. Painted wood, pitted iron, water falling earthward from his face, each droplet's path so foreshortened it seemed motionless and shrinking until it struck the ground. He shut his eyes and listened to his breath blowing. When he turned, rain fell evenly through the night. He was alone. He looked about, then spotted the figure standing near the corner of the milk house. Having once learned the trick, Edgar could not unsee him. The figure gestured. His legs blurred into skirts of rain, and then he disappeared from view. The dogs began to bark. Edgar found him standing in front of the pens. All the dogs were out, peering forward, unafraid, excited, recognition in their voice. Their tails jerked back and forth, throwing sprays of water. The figure turned to him and his arms moved at sign. Trails of water fell through the air. The distance and the figure indistinct form and the figure's indistinct form made it difficult to read. Edgar stepped forward. The figure repeated the sign, release a dog. Edgar blinked in the rain. Why? You think I'm not real? Open a pen. Edgar walked to Essie's pen. Essay's pen. He flipped up the latch and linked his fingers through the wire mesh and pulled the door open. Essay bounded out at once. She dropped her nose to the ground at the spot where the figure had stood and slid a paw along the grass. She look at, looked at Edgar and then into the yard. Her tail swung happily behind her. The figure gestured a recall, but Essay was already closing the distance at her trot. When she arrived, she circled several times, her shape contorting as she passed behind and finished on his left in a sit. The figure stepped forward, a water shimmer, and turned and signaled a down. Essay dropped onto the wet grass at once. The figure bent down and pressed his hand against the side of her face. A stream of water coursed along her already soaked cheek, and she panted happily and pulled her lips back in a grin of pleasure and lapped at the finger's hand. Her tongue passed through a stream of water. She closed her mouth reflexively and swallowed and began to pant again. The figure looked back toward the barn and signaled a broad sit, and in unison all seven dogs behind Edgar sat. Then he signaled a release. A moment later, one by one, they stood. They trotted back into the barn, and a moment later, the canvas flaps parted, and seven muzzles appeared. You see? At last, the figure signaled Essay to kennel. She trotted to her pen and disappeared into the barn. Before Edgar had latched the door behind her, she had joined the other dogs looking out at them. He turned back to the rain. Edgar, what? What are you doing here? Don't you recognize me? I don't want to say. I'm, I'm not sure. I might. How many times have we stood here and looked back at the house together? How many times have we counted the deer in the field from here? How many times did I lift you into the branches of those trees to pick an apple? Look at me, Edgar. What do you see? I don't know. What do you see? I know why you're here. I'm sorry. I tried so hard. You think you might have saved me? I couldn't think of what to do. I tried everything. I would have died anyway. No, I couldn't tell them. There could have been doctors. They would have done nothing. But it was there. I, I made it worse. The rain figure bowed his head. A space of perhaps three feet separated them. After a moment, the figure looked up and stepped forward and began to raise his hands as if to embrace him. Edgar couldn't help himself. He stepped back. Instantly, a wave of remorse washed through him. I'm sorry, he signed. I didn't mean that. You didn't understand what you were seeing that day. The figure turned and melted away toward the front of the barn, then rounded the corner of the old milk, stone, milk house. After a moment, Edgar followed. He stood before the barn doors, and under the floodlight, his sign was easy to read. Go inside now before the rain stops. And do what? Search. For what? What he lost.
what he thinks is lost forever. Then the figure stepped away from the door. Edgar ripped the old iron bar away and turned the latch inside at the latch handle, and inside it was dark but dry, and the cessation of rain shocked him. He looked out the door, but it was only rain falling again. None of the dogs barked, though a few stood watching from their pens. He pushed the workshop door open and froze, unable to cross the threshold at first. He reached inside and flipped up the light switch and surveyed the room. Workbench to the left, pegboard covered with tools mounted on the wall above it, vice twisted open halfway except for the filing cabinets. They had barely touched any of that in the winter, and a velvet whore of straw dust lay over the bench. Across from him, the most stairs led upward, and in front of them, shelves filled with cans of paint and creosote, their labels stained with drips and runners. He took a breath and stepped inside. He took the paint cans off the shelf and stacked them on the workbench. Though the rest of the workshop was covered in dust, the paint cans were not. Only a thin powder covered them, as though they had been recently moved. When he finished, only a pile of old brushes and rollers remained, stacked haphazardly at one end of the shelf, and, then, and these he put on the workbench too. Beneath the shelves on the floor sat the two enormous cans of scrap his father had been trying to remove that day, brimming with bent nails. Stripped screws, spare machine parts, the iron rusted to a dark brown. The steel parts dull gray. He crouched and tried to tip the nearest one out from the wall. After the third or fourth heave, the welded metal handle snapped off and he tumbled backward. He returned to it on all fours, hugged it, and lunged. The bucket tottered and fell and he quickly rolled it along, leaving a trail of orange scrap. He knelt and swapped the scrap about. The second can had lost its handle long before. Another spray of scrap in the process, something sharp had slid the tip of his finger. Blood mixed with the rust on his hands began to drip to the floor. He got down on his knees again, but it was hopeless as he sat back. Under the mow stairs, a jumble of dusty odds and ends lay tucked into the crevice where the stair stringers met the concrete floor. A paintbrush long ago fallen from behind the shelf, a bunched up rag of tin, a tin of washers, he scuttled over. One by one, he tossed them into the workshop. A maroon drop of blood caught in the cobweb below the last tread and shivered blackly into the air. He reached out and brushed the cobweb away. There against the wall lay a plastic barreled syringe. He picked it up and blew the dust away and held it to the light. The plunger had been pressed three quarters of the way down. The black double gasket touched the final graduated mark on the barrel. The needle shaft reflected the light in the long, clean line. He shook the thing. Two glassy crystals clicked within the barrel. He walked into the rain with the syringe in his hand, night blind from the barn lights. The rain had slackened to a drizzle, and at first he couldn't make out his father, and he looked around in a panic before realizing he stood exactly where Edgar had last seen him. The rain had grown so fine his form was barely discernible. Edgar held out the syringe. This was under the stairs. Yes. What does it mean? You've seen him use one. Claude? Edgar looked at the Impala sitting in the driveway, then the dark house. At his bedroom window, he thought he saw the shine of Almandine's eyes. He's proposed. She won't accept. She laughed at him, but she will. When she's alone, she'll accept. She won't. She... Before Edgar could protest again, his father set his hand flat against the center of Edgar's chest, a whispery splash on his skin. At first he thought his father only meant to lay his hand on him in a gesture that meant be still and listen, but then he brought his other hand forward. Ah, I just want to turn the page so quickly. And Edgar felt something pass into him, and his father made as if to cradle Edgar's heart. The sensation was so strange, Edgar thought his heart would stop. But his father only cupped the thing in his hand as though it were a newborn pup. On his face, Edgar made out regret and anger and joy and most of all, unutterable sorrow. Any thought to protest or resist left him. The world grayed, then memories flooded into Edgar in a cascade like the drops of rain passing through his father's figure. Images seen by a baby, a toddler, a young man, an adult all his father's memories given to him at once. Standing over a crib looking at a silent baby whose hands move 
Over his chest, Trudy, a young woman, laughing. Almondina, wet blind pup, visions of a young boy with a younger boy beside him holding something in the air, something bloody and smiling. A thousand ruby lit dogs, and with the images, a sense of responsibility, the need to put himself between Claude and the world. Dogs fighting, storms mounting the field, trees slipstreaming past the truck windows, dogs sleeping, running, sick, joyful, dying, always and everywhere dogs, then Claude retreating from the workshop, searching the floor for something. Darkness, and now, standing before him, a boy as clear as glass, his heart beating in two cupped hands. Edgar fell to his knees, gasping. He leaned forward, emptied his stomach into a pool of rainwater. From the corner of his eye, he saw the syringe lying in the mud, light glinting off the shaft of the needle. He looked up, panting. His father was still there. Whatever he's wanted, he's taken ever since he was a child. I'll tell the police. They won't believe you. Edgar began to sob. You're not real. You can't be real. Find? What? Stop. I couldn't read that. His father signed it again, fingerspelling the last word. Find? H-A-A. He couldn't make it out. It was H-A-A and then something else followed by a very distinct one or I. H-A-A something I. I still didn't... The mist had lessened further and his father was barely visible. His hand sprayed out on a gust of wind. Then he vanished entirely. Edgar thought he was gone forever, but when the wind died, he reappeared, kneeling now in front of him, his hands so faint Edgar could barely make out the Morian. Sorry. He could barely make out the motion. I'm sorry. Tears in my eyes. I can barely see the words. A touch of the thumb to his forehead. The eye, hand held to his chest. And then his father reached forward a second time. He thought he would rather die himself than feel that sensation again. He scrabbled along the muddy ground until the barn was against his back and signed furiously into the, the night, arms crossed over his head. Don't touch me, don't touch me, don't touch me. And then everything quieted to absolute silence. The mist grew so refined it made no noise as it came to earth, only the drip of water from the eaves he could not bring himself to look up until it had stopped altogether. From behind a feathered break of clouds, the moon emerged, a gleaming sickle of bone, as pointed at as the syringe beside him. The trees at the edge of the forest glowed blue. He walked along the driveway and looked back at the barn. The dogs were at the front of their pens holding sit stays, coats like mercury. Their muzzles tracked him as he approached. They lowered their brows and ducked their heads, not wanting to be out anymore, but they did not move. From the moment they opened their eyes, the dogs were taught to watch and listen and trust, to think and choose. This was the lesson behind every minute of training. They were taught something beyond simple obedience, that through the training all things could be spoken. Edgar himself believed this believe they had the right to ask of the dogs certain things, but the more forcefully they asked, the more certain they had to be, for the dogs would obey. Doubtful, uncomfortable, uneasy, frightened, they would obey. The line of dogs waited for him to signal a release. The clouds gaped and folded and closed across the moon. We're going to stop there. The next, we're into part three, what hands do. Well, that was a turn of events, friends, wasn't it? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That was just chilling. Let me know what you think. Leave me some comments, friends, and subscribe. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time.